Do you need to find the skills to How would you tell people that this is? You first, first, first. How would you tell this? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm research on that. Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. Today we're going to talk about Dr. Robert Carter of Creation Ministries International. Dr. Carter is a marine biologist whom genetic engineer. Interestingly, he might actually watch this as he knows who I am and associates me, correctly I might add, with Dr. Dan Stern Cardinal and Erica, also known as Guts at Gibbon. Although the one time he previously deigned to reply to us as a group, he confused me with another YouTuber with a similar name and aesthetic. I want to say a special thank you here to Jonathan Sarfati of CMI, who fixed this problem when it was brought to his attention. He and I have a lot of things we don't agree on, and his work on anatomy and paleontology is infuriatingly bad, but at least he cares not to put the wrong person on blast. Now, I suspect this mistake by Dr. Carter was an honest one, and so I don't harbor any hard feelings about it, although the amount of information he gave out about the other YouTuber if it had been given out about me would have constituted a dox. So if you watch this, Dr. Carter, please be careful who you mention and how much of their personal information you give out. Also, while he's quick to name and shame his critics when he incorrectly thinks that they have failed to point out how bad his work is, when admitting that those same critics are right, as he recently did, he failed to mention any of our names. I found that particularly irksome, as it was in fact I who pointed out to the public, Carter included, that no, his conflation of cheetah's census population size with effective population size is entirely inappropriate. Oh well. Finally, since I think Dr. Carter may be watching, I'll be addressing him with the second person pronoun in this video, and because of that odd history, I'm going to be a little more snarky than normal. So let's pick up with Dr. Carter after some introductory remarks that aren't really about science per se. Let me give you a framework, an idea of how to think about science. What if science was just like, I'm going to call it an interpretive filter of reality? then it would be a philosophical position or set thereof instead of an investigative technique that is informed by interpretive frameworks, which I suppose could be renamed filters. What if science was just a way of thinking that might help to explain things? So one way of thinking is Zeus is standing on top of a mountaintop and he's got his lightning bolt ready. And when I get out my Petri dish and I do an experiment, he's going to either zap my lightning bolt or not zap my lightning bolt. Then we would be invoking non-natural, fundamentally unpredictable forces. And the thing is, I feel like you're not okay with that when you call the supernatural force in your investigation Zeus, but if you call it God, the Holy Spirit, Christ, or something like that, then you are okay with it. But fundamentally, doing an experiment where you expect any God's intervention to significantly affect the outcome is useless, even if it happens to be the God you believe in, and even if that God exists. That is a way of thinking. It's not really very conducive to science, is it? No, and that's exactly why science adopts methodological naturalism. And remember, whenever you say you're using supernatural causation in science, I'm going to call you back to this point. Now, it's a really bad scientific uh, idea, but you might actually run an experiment and get the right results, even though Zeus had nothing to do with it. Yep, even bad science can occasionally stumble on the right answer. Basically, that was how technological progress worked until the scientific revolution. People incrementally stumbled into inventions like the wheel, pillars, the arch, plows, yokes for horses, etc. Or let's say it this way. Imagine evolutionary theory is a certain way of looking at the world. And it is. Well, it's a way of looking at biological populations over time. That's only a small subset of all the things you could look at. And in those cases, evolution isn't really going to help. And it does get some things right. Doesn't it? quite a lot of things, like how to predict the resistance to various drugs and pathogens, where to find new fossils, it correctly suggests new medical treatments, it successfully predicts the outcome of genetic studies, etc, etc, etc. Yes, it does. Absolutely, it gets some things right. And that's what Charles Darwin talked about. He never talked about what he didn't get right, he talked about what he did get right. What? The guy talked a lot about what he got wrong. What comes to mind most prominently is the blended inheritance and gemules, neither of which is correct. Seriously, why do guys like this just make up nonsense about Charles Darwin? You know, he doesn't really matter. But also, if you're going to talk about him, you could at least not lie about him. Now, Dr. Carter, if you're not lying and instead you're just massively ignorant and making things up or just assuming that what your colleagues have told you is true, then I apologize for implying that you're dishonest rather than just massively incompetent. If you watch, let me know which one it is for future reference. And that's what evolution has ever since then have talked about. Absolutely, it gets some things right, but that doesn't mean itself that it is right. 
That's true. It is indeed possible that some major aspect of modern evolutionary biology is wrong, even though it has continuously been one of the most successful theories in history. But whatever new things come along to replace it, it will have to account for all that success, and explain all the same data not just as well as evolution, but better. If I were you, I wouldn't hold my breath on that one. Now, I'm not going to claim that my view of science is perfect. Well, that's good, because we're going to see it demonstrably really, really, really far from perfect. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that your biases have led you to a point where, on average, you're worse at biology than someone starting their sophomore year in undergrad for a biology degree. I would never do that. But can you see that if the reality is these red lines, and your way of thinking is the gray lines, that the tighter you get your gray lines lined up with the red lines, the more you'll be able to explain in science? I mean, instead of interpretive filter, you could have just said theory, because that's what really we're talking about. But yes, it is not a bad visual analogy. And the thing is, I agree with you that we should try our hardest to match our theories to reality, which is rather the point of things like testing, prediction, and all that science stuff. You can see that, right? Yeah. That's science. The reason that evolution seems so profound as a scientific idea is it claims to explain everything. I don't know what world you're living on, but it seeks to explain the origin, development, and patterns of biological diversity. That's it. It doesn't have a thing to say about how to build a computer, what's going on in the core of the Earth, how to analyze data from the James Webb Space Telescope, what your next move in chess should be, or anything else. But what they're doing is they're only explaining the things in between those lines. They're actually skipping over tons and tons of data. That's a bit ironic, since young Earth creationists are notorious for ignoring, in some cases, more than nine-tenths of the data in any field they investigate. In fact, documenting this fact in depth and in detail is the project of The Rocks Were There, both Volume 1, which is out now, and Volume 2, which is on the way, from R.J. Downard and Jackson Wheat, both friends of the channel. On the other hand, literature searches for new research projects over in real science land can take months, and missing even a few papers can result in rejection of research for lack of context. And they can no longer get away with what they got away with 100 years ago. Because the scientific revolution has changed everything. What are we getting away with? Okay, I'm using words already. I haven't really defined anything. Let's define a couple of terms here, real simply. That does seem like a good idea. I'm going to prove to you that science depends upon philosophy. Easy. I have a PhD. What does that stand for? Philosophy doctor, which, fun fact, is why the P and the D are capitalized, but not the H. The H is just part of the philosophy. I have a doctor of what philosophy? What philosophy is the underlying philosophy that draws all of evolutionary science? What is it? It's called naturalism. Nope. The philosophy naturalism doesn't drive science. Many scientists are not philosophical naturalists. In fact, it's methodological naturalism that drives science, because assuming miracles are a significant factor cuts us off from making any conclusions on the basis of empirical results, and you yourself know that this is silly, because you said this. What if science was just a way of thinking that might help to explain things? So one way of thinking is Zeus is standing on top of a mountaintop, and he's got his lightning bolt ready, and when I get out my petri dish and I do an experiment, he's going to either zap my lightning bolt or not zap my lightning bolt. That is a way of thinking. It's not really very conducive to science, is it? Ism is a belief, right? Sometimes, but not always. There are things like atavism, altruism, botulism, escapism, embolism, euphemism, gigantism, dwarfism, exorcism, biblicism, masochism, mentalism, angelicism, cretinism, catabolism, chimerism, tourism, journalism, metabolism, nominalism, alcoholism, bipedalism, dimorphism, literalism, anachronism, athleticism, bilingualism, terrorism, baptism, hermaphroditism, autism, cannibalism, magnetism, neologism, etc. It's really more of a state or existence. Atheism is the state of rejecting gods. Theism is accepting gods. Jingoism is the state of being aggressively patriotic, etc. So I guess we're off to a bad start already. Theism, belief in God, naturalism, it's a belief in the natural world. No, it's belief that the natural world is all that exists. If it were simply belief in the natural world, then nearly everyone, theist or not, would be a naturalist. But further, it's also used in the sense of methodological naturalism to mean lack of consideration of things outside the natural world, regardless of belief. It's the belief that natural processes can explain everything. Nope. In the context of science, it's the practice of only allowing for natural explanations because science is specifically an investigation of how the natural world operates.
My doctorate is in philosophy of no God. More natural philosophy, which while not rejecting supernatural agents, simply doesn't attempt to account for them or use them as explanations, because those are not useful to the investigation of how the natural world operates naturally. You catch that? Absolutely, that is the underlying philosophy underneath the pursuit of modern science. Weird then how many scientists are philosophical supernaturalists while remaining steadfast methodological naturalists in their work. What is evolution then? In this context, it's the biological theory explaining the patterns and emergence of biological diversity in populations over time. I'm a biologist, right? But I'm not an evolutionist. What's a biologist? He's someone who studies life. By that definition, I would argue that you are not a biologist, because frankly, Bobby, may I call you Bobby? From what I've seen of you, you just get basic facts wrong. So basic that I have trouble attributing it to ignorance in a PhD in biology. And then you try to convince Christians that they're right for absurdly bad reasons. I study living things, and I can't get enough of it. I'm not even scratched the surface of what's there. It is an amazing occupation to be in. If you ever want to become a biologist, you're going to be poor the rest of your life, but you're going to have a really good time. So I would encourage you, enjoy life. Don't lie about science. If you take biology, say this is biology, and you add to it the philosophy of naturalism, you naturally get evolution. No, evolution is what happens when you look at the evidence of biology without already having rejected it. That's why virtually all Christian and otherwise theist biologists, in fact, accept it. See, what you're doing here, Bob, is creating a false dichotomy. It's creations versus atheists. First, atheists don't have a monopoly on not being Christian. We have Hindus, Buddhists, Jains, Muslims, and Jews, just name a few. This isn't a fight between atheists and Christians. It's a fight between those who are honest with the data and those who are not. You're not on the honest side. Evolution is simply the outworking. It's trying to explain life using only natural causes. Hey, remember when you said that invoking a supernatural agent in your experiment was silly? Because I remember... What if science was just a way of thinking that might help to explain things? So one way of thinking is Zeus is standing on top of a mountaintop, and he's got his lightning bolt ready, and when I get out my Petri dish and I do an experiment, he's going to either zap my lightning bolt or not zap my lightning bolt. That is a way of thinking. It's not really very conducive to science, is it? It still doesn't get less silly because the one you evoke just happens to be the one you believe in. Now, I, I'm, I, I would call myself a biblical creationist. Cool, but so would Hugh Ross, and so would many of the folks at Biologos, the big name in Christian theistic evolution. But you don't get a monopoly on biblical interpretation, nor do your buddies at CMI. I want to recount something I heard from Todd Wood. Unfortunately, I'm having trouble finding it, so, if you don't want to believe he said it or said something like it, that's fine. It's the idea that matters. He wrote a book with Daryl R. Falk called The Fool and the Heretic. Falk is a theistic evolutionist, and the book is about their mutual interaction in terms of trying to earnestly interpret the Bible and look at science both on its own and in the context of their Christian faith. I haven't read the book, but I did look at some point at the promotional stuff that Wood made about it because the topic is interesting to me. One of the things that Wood said is that in interacting with those Christians outside the Young Earth creationist camp, he would often, in exasperation, say that the big reason he believes, as he does, is that he's just trying to take the Bible seriously. But they would reply that they were too. At first, he didn't believe them, but as he got to know them, got to see how seriously they took their religious convictions, as well as how much time they would often spend studying not just science, but the Bible, he realized that they were right. They were not taking the text of the Bible less seriously. They were indeed honestly convinced differently than he was. Taking the mantle of biblical on oneself in this matter is just arrogant. What does that mean? It means I take biology the study of life and I add my views of God. So do the fine folks at Biologos, Robbie. So do they. Theism. And you get creation out of that. Now there's different views of God, there's different understandings of God, and there's different types of, of theism, there's different types of creationism. There's young earth creationists like me, there's old earth creationists, there's evolutionary creationists, even known as an oxymoron, a contradictory terms, they call themselves evolutionary creationists. That's why I prefer the term theistic evolution. The ship has sailed on creationism commonly being used to cover any sort of theistic accounts of origins, and I think them trying to claw back the word is futile. There's lots of different ways to approach this because there's lots of different views of God. Okay so far? Yes, I'm okay. Thanks for asking. Okay, what's evolution? Evolution is a theory in biology that explains how organisms change and diversify over time in response to factors such as natural and sexual selection, genetic drift, etc. 
One of its findings is that the most parsimonious reconstruction of the history of life is that all so far discovered life shares common ancestry. The minimum that counts as evolution is a change in allele frequencies in a population of biological organisms from one generation to the next. Have you ever heard it defined, evolutions just change over time? Yeah, and like dictionaries, when talking about the word outside the context of biology. I heard that in just about every college class I was ever in. Before they actually gave the biological definition, I assume. That is the stupidest definition of evolution you can possibly imagine. No, sorry, not stupidest. It's the lamest definition of evolution that you can imagine. No, it's just the basic definition of the word in English outside of specialist contexts. Sorry that you don't like that English has words that are polysemous and different registers. I don't know, go learn a language that doesn't, like Ichthuil or something. No, don't go learn Ichthuil, it's probably impossible, just get over it. Why? Because I believe in change over time. But I don't believe in evolution. Actually, based on other stuff I've seen from you, you do believe in evolution. But I'm sure we'll get there, so let's not jump the gun. All the change that Darwin saw is change. Yeah, okay, that happens. Yep, that happens. Sure enough, that happens too. Okay, got it. Where's the evolution? Why? Why am I not an evolutionist? I've had a lot of people say, oh, you believe in change? Ha ha, you're an evolutionist. <laughs> no, I'm not. Because what if the change goes back and forth? then it's evolution. That already happens in populations under selection pressure from medium to long-term climate cycles like El Nino and La Nina cycles in the Pacific. What if it goes in a circle? What if it goes downhill? You'd have to clarify what you mean by that. But if either involves a change to allele frequencies over generations, then they're evolution. Change in itself is not evolution. Evolution has to have upward change. Says who? Most people who reject it? That's what we call a straw man. Also, I like how we haven't defined upward. Near as I can tell, you just mean change I emotionally like. Well, guess what? Nature is under no obligation to make you happy. And that upward change, if you go back in time, should trace back all life, should trace back to a common ancestor. Not really. Turns out it does. But there was no guarantee. Evolution would be just as true if life on Earth had some other number of origins than one. If it had turned out that, say, bacteria were not related to archaea and eukaryotes, that wouldn't invalidate all of evolution. And of course, evolution would predict that if we were to find an alien biosphere, it almost certainly would not share any common ancestry with Earth life. Evolution is a belief in the common ancestry of all things. Only in that it is a hypothesis based on evolution that has turned out to be very well supported. It's not a core part of the idea that all life have common ancestry with all other life. It just turns out that that's how it seems. Oh, but you'll never hear it defined that way. Why? Because you can observe change. You can't observe common ancestry. I mean, y you can. Look, here are a list of papers reporting speciation events, which is in fact watching common ancestry.
Plus, just like how you can observe paternity in a paternity test, you can observe common ancestry. In fact, that's exactly how it works. In order to say that such genetic tests do not display common ancestry, you'd have to come up with a reason why the techniques that work for parent and offspring do not also work for cousins, or at least how far apart cousinhood can be inferred, and why. Near as I can tell, no one has even tried to propose such a way to tell when genetic testing of this sort stops working. And on top of that, there's the fact that even if it's not observable, it makes predictions, predictions which routinely come true, including in fields such as medicine, genetics, and paleontology. Those confirmed testable predictions are in fact what some might call the gold standard in science. Good trick, huh? There's no trick. All of this is pretty open. No one is hiding something about the definition or the conclusions of evolution. The fact that it might not always filter down correctly to lay people is more of a problem with science reporting and communication than with some kind of dishonesty. The Bible, in the first chapter, makes some very radical claims about history. The Bible, in that first chapter, claims that God created the entire universe in six consecutive 24-hour-ish, I say ish because the first day I have no, there's no light yet, how can I count anything? But as soon as there's light, evening, morning, evening, morning, evening, morning, evening, morning, evening, morning. Six times it says that evening and morning, there was one day, two day, third, third day, fourth day. I just want to remind you and my audience that your interpretation of Genesis is not the only one Christians hold in good faith, nor are any such interpretations important to science. If science happens to contradict your personal interpretation of Genesis, that's not grounds for change to science on its own. It might be motivation for you to try and find evidence to change science, but the account in Genesis is not that evidence, and even less so is your interpretation of it. You know, linguistically, the writer of Genesis painted a box, and you can't escape that box. You know, linguistically, I have no evidence that you speak Hebrew at all, Dr. Carter. So, because I don't really care about your interpretation of Genesis or your takes on Hebrew, I'm going to skip until you're done talking about it. Let's talk about natural selection. You've heard the phrase natural selection, right? Yes, I have. Do you know what it is? Do you know what it means? Let me read you something from Charles Darwin himself. Now, this is 1800s writing, and Charles Darwin, I mean, basically, he's got long sections in German in his book because, you know, everyone knows German, right? Um, I'm going to need a citation. Because as far as I know, none of Darwin's published works make any significant use of German. In fact, Darwin wasn't much of a linguist. He hated Latin and Greek and was passable at French. And according to his son Francis, he was horrible at German and could only read it with the help of a dictionary. And he read it exceptionally slowly and never learned to pronounce it. Let's just hear from Francis himself in his book, Life and Letters of Charles Darwin. Much of his scientific reading was in German, and this was a serious labor to him. In reading a book after him, I was often struck at seeing from the pencil marks made each day where he had left off, how little he could read at a time. He used to call German the Verdammt, pronounced as if in English. He was especially indignant with Germans because he was convinced that they could write simply if they chose, and often praised Professor Hildebrand of Freiburg for writing German which was actually as clear as French. He sometimes gave a German sentence to a friend, a patriotic German lady, and used to laugh at her if she did not translate it fluently. He himself learned German simply by hammering away with a dictionary. He would say that his only way was to read a sentence a great many times over, and at last the meaning occurred to him. When he began German long ago, he boasted of the fact, as he used to tell, to Sir J. Hooker, who replied, Ah, my dear fellow, that's nothing. I have begun it many times. In spite of his want of grammar, he managed to get on wonderfully with German, and the sentences that he failed to make out were generally difficult ones. He never attempted to speak German correctly, but pronounced the words as though they were English, and this made it not a little difficult to help him when he read out a German sentence and asked for a translation. He certainly had a bad ear for vocal sounds, so he found it impossible to perceive small differences in pronunciation. End quote. In fact, after searching, albeit briefly, through the origin of species, the only German I can find is references to works in German or by Germans. I can't find any actual text by Darwin in the language. This also fits in with the fact that despite having been sent a copy of Das Kapital by Karl Marx in German, he apparently never opened more than the front cover, as all the pages were uncut at the time of his death. So, Dr. Carter either produced this long section in German, or stopped spouting nonsense about Darwin. Of course, all of this is irrelevant, because Darwin is not a prophet of science. Science doesn't have prophets. No one really cares in the year of our Lord, 2022, what Darwin wrote or said, except for historical reasons. What, aren't you educated? 
You don't know German? Oh, I don't know German either. But he, he has a very thick style of writing. So let me parse this and see if we can understand it. He says, You might think that this block of English text is translated from a German section of one of Darwin's books, maybe Origin of Species or Descent of Man. Nope. It's from his book, The Variation of Animals and Plants Under Domestication, and the text is in English, not German. I have no idea why you're just making this German thing up, Dr. Carter, unless you just credulously heard it from your colleagues. If that's the case, may I suggest to you that it is evidence that the company you keep is of low moral character when it comes to honesty, and that perhaps you disassociate yourself from them. If then, organic beings, or living things, in a state of nature, vary even in a slight degree. Catch that phrase, a slight degree. Don't worry, I caught it. Go on. If in the long course of ages, in other words, we add magic millions of years. Nice poisoning of the well, but the age of the Earth being at least a minimum of millions of years is a firm outcome of basic physics and geology. If you want to deny it, then you're going to have to build a whole new model of particle physics. Good luck with that. And let's remember that when the rate team from ICR tried to debunk radiometric dating, they couldn't. They came up with such amazing conclusions as that the amount of decay they needed would generate enough heat to, and I quote, vaporize the rocks completely. And they proposed such unusual mechanisms as, again, quoting here, a sudden expansion of the fabric of space. And in their final conclusions in Volume 2, Chapter 10, they state, the removal of heat was so rapid it likely involved processes other than conduction, convection, or radiation. For example, the cooling of granite plutons would have taken thousands of years by conventional thermal diffusion. Of course, God was directly involved in all of these events, so it's possible that he employed some supernatural process, which does not occur today, or cannot be detected." End quote. I'm not sure if it's necessary to tell you, Dr. Carter, but conduction, convection, and radiation are basically the only games in town unless you want to invoke magic, which remember, you said was silly. What if science was just a way of thinking that might help to explain things. So one way of thinking is Zeus is standing on top of a mountaintop and he's got his lightning bolt ready. And when I get out my Petri dish and I do an experiment, he's gonna either zap my lightning bolt or not zap my lightning bolt. That is a way of thinking. It's not really very conducive to science, is it? Inheritable variations arise in any way advantageous to any being under excessively complex and changing relations of life. Oh man, how do you read this stuff? I say this at the danger of being a bit too rude, but just try not being pathetic. Sorry that a sentence with a few too many clauses is too much for you, doctor. What he's saying is, the environment is really complicated. Which, you know, it is. And he's saying, give me something where, you know, this hair is a little bit longer, this dog is just a tiny little bit smaller, bigger, blacker, or whiter, whatever variation you want. Then the severe and often recurrent struggle for existence will determine that those variations, however slight, which are favorable, shall be preserved or selected, and those which are unfavorable shall be destroyed. I know that it was hard to read, but is that kind of like your view of natural selection? Pretty much. Little teeny variation, give it enough time, and eventually, you know, nature will sort itself out. It doesn't work this way. Odd coming from someone who relies on natural selection to get all the extant species of much fewer species on the Ark. You better hope it works that way on steroids, or it's gonna be a big problem for your Ark. Not that the Ark doesn't already have basically infinite problems that preclude a literalist view of the story from being true already. This is just one of the more obvious ones. He's actually completely wrong. Let me give you an example. Let's say I had a twin brother. Um, my twin brother looks like Adonis. I look like me. Nah, of course we both look like Adonis. <laughs> Duh. But see, what I didn't tell you was I was born, um, it's not true. Let's say I was born without toes. Very unlikely if you're identical twins. And if you're not, then that's probably due to a difference in genetics. But Go on. I have no toes on my feet. He's got normal feet. Now we're out picking berries in the woods and a bear jumps out. Which one of us gets eaten? Ceteris paribus, probably you. What if he's half blind? Then it's a different scenario, you dunce. Don't invalidate your own hypothetical. Just get to the point. What if I've got real good ear uh, hearing? Then it's a different scenario, you dunce. Don't invalidate your own hypothetical. Just get to the point. Which I don't, but what if I did? What if, you know, I'm, I'm really self-conscious about my toes, and so I'm actually, I run marathons every day just because I want to show the world that I'm actually, I can walk normal, and he's just a, you know, couch potato. What if giving infinite caveats after you set up the hypothetical is stupid because it invalidates the whole point of thought experiments? What if the bear jumped off on the left side of the path instead of the right side of the path? Then, non ceteris paribus, so who cares? Dumb luck. By Jove, you've done it, Doctor! 
You've discovered that there are probabilistic aspects to evolutionary theory. We must send word to the papers at once, and of course the Academy will want to hear of this. Except, oh wait, everyone knew about this. It's part of genetic drift. But in the long run, since reproductive success is probabilistic, and being well adapted gives an organism a higher chance, but not a guarantee, it's not a long-term problem for natural selection, because selection pressure occurs regardless of the probabilistic aspects of evolution. Now, does it mean that some beneficial mutations won't make it? Yeah, but we knew that too. You see, even something as extreme as tollessness, natural selection can't see it. Yes, it absolutely can, because while we can come up with a whole host of just-so stories, where it's not a big enough problem to eliminate one from the environment, those are not going to be repeated across the population with enough regularity. Therefore, the underlying maladaptive nature of having no toes, which you yourself assumed in order for this whole thought experiment to work, will with high probability be selected against. This is to do with the law of large numbers. If I flip a coin, everyone knows that I have a 50-50 chance of getting heads or tails. So let's say I flip it four times. The most likely outcome is two tails and two heads, but the chance of, say, four heads is 1 in 16. Not exactly a miraculous occurrence. In fact, even the intuitive answer of two heads and two tails has a chance of less than 50%, with the actual odds being 37.5%. But let's give ourselves a couple million coin tosses. At this point, the likelihood of deviating from the expected statistical average of 50% heads and 50% tails by a significant amount becomes extremely low, and it is lower and lower the more times we flip the coin. Overall, the more attempts at something with a probabilistic outcome one makes, the closer to the actual probabilistic distribution the whole set is going to be. So sure, you can be dishonest, Robert, and go with an example of one, but we know that when you expand to a population of thousands or millions, or in the case of humans, billions, these weird little quirks are going to even out. And so if a feature truly is advantageous in the environment, it will likely spread, and if it's actually maladaptive, it will likely die out. There's too many confounding factors in nature that influence whether or not you live or die based on that trait. Once again, the law of large numbers solves this quite neatly. Even if a trait confers only a small advantage to an individual, one which can fairly easily be negated by luck, luck evens out over many individuals and many lifetimes. There's traits that interact with each other, the environment is interacting, and, then, and there's just, you know, you get struck by a meteor and I don't get struck by a meteor. I mean, what can you do? Nothing, but that's why evolution is fundamentally a phenomenon that happens at the population level, not the individual level. And population genetics is a fundamentally statistical field. So these hypothetical individual interactions aren't really important. This is like asking how can an ant colony work together by means of chemical signals when you can easily take an ant and crush it, and now it can't signal anything to anyone. Well, in fact, it works because only a small proportion of the ants are subject to random unavoidable death. So on the whole, the statistics of the colony dictate that it will likely manage to survive just fine, and it would take a systematic and high-frequency death rate to cause a breakdown in this organization, which does occur. Right now you're looking at such a thing, an ant death spiral. But on the whole, we notice that despite the fact that any one ant may very well indeed meet an untimely death and that colony lose its particular signaling capacity, we see ant colonies being extremely successful all over the Earth. Sometimes, much to our chagrin. All right, and with Dr. Carter's almost complete inability to understand things like, you know, math, numbers, natural selection, we're going to leave it off for next time. I really hope you enjoyed this. If you did, make sure to hit the like button and leave a comment telling me what you liked about it. If you didn't, feel free to hit the dislike button and again, tell me in the comments what you didn't like about it. Either way, I hope you subscribe to the channel and use the bell icon to turn on all notifications so you're always notified when I have new content. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Thanks for watching, but before you go, I just want to say a special thank you to my channel members and my patrons, especially those pledging $20 or above. Bob Knob, Work in Progress, Bent Hovind, Cynically Skeptic, Denny5252, Ian Chen, John Ackerman, Landon Knoll, Mabdi Babdi, McSpooks, Sphincter of Doom, The Venerable Veed, and Patrick Dennis. As you probably know, YouTube is a very volatile platform, and from month to month my income on the channel can swing wildly. The people you see on screen are directly supporting so that I don't have to worry too much about that and the channel can keep going as it is, and perhaps even improving. If you'd like to join this team, there are links below to join the channel or in the description to join the Patreon. The Patreon starts as low as $1 a month, and the channel memberships start as low as $1.99 a month. On Patreon, you can even get a discount for pledging annually. If you do decide to pledge, you'll get access to an exclusive Discord server just for channel supporters, as well as early access to all of my pre-recorded videos, often up to two months in advance, 
Higher tiers will unlock even better perks. Now, if the annual or monthly pledge isn't right for you, but you still want to support the channel, there is a merch store down in the description, as well as an Amazon wishlist, just for me. And if financial support isn't something you can or want to do, then if you still want to help out the channel, please just like and share these videos and make sure you comment on them. It really helps the channel out. Thanks again for watching.